Yeah, uh, thanks, Joy, so much. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about two things that I worked on uh, last year and the beginning of this year, which are uh, selection course and type details, which are features inside Figma. And, uh, you know, we'll see, uh, we'll see what we learn from that. And I hope uh, the process is interesting. Uh, I also assume that you somewhat, all of you are somewhat familiar with selection course and type details, although I will show them um, briefly. So let's start with selection colors. Um, I have here Figma. Uh, it is actually a little bit of a preview. Don't tell anybody, little something we may be shipping next week or something. But basically, uh, for me, it's just a Figma file with different colors. And selection course is basically a feature that allows me to uh, click on a set of things or even literally select everything and see all of the colors that go inside it, right? Whether they're styles or individual colors and do something with them sort of globally, right? So I don't have to click on individual things and worry about whether it's a stroke or a fill. I just see gray is just used as gray and I can change it all to a different color as you can see right now. So that's the basic principle of selection colors. Um, and it's, uh, it seems like a simple feature, right? And, and uh, it was something actually that I wanted even before joining Figma. <laughs> So when I was a Figma user a long time ago, you can sort of date it by the UI looking, looking a little bit older. I really wanted something like this. So I, uh, I sent uh, uh, this mock-up and a few other mock-ups to the team saying like, if you ever wanted to do something like this, I think this would help. And this is another use case for Figma right now, which is, you know, if you have a text with different colors, um, you, you know, it's really sometimes hard to get to those colors, right? What if you had selection colors to help you out? So, you know, I sent it to the team and then I kind of forgot about it, to be honest. Uh, at some point I joined Figma myself and at some point uh, we had a maker week and maker weeks, hack weeks are always interesting because you kind of have to figure out, um, are you going to do something very wild and experimental that will never ship or are you doing something tactical that's like almost close to shipping. And at this maker week, I actually wanted to do something buildable and so did another engineer, Jonas. And so we talked and we thought, what could we build? And uh, I resurrected this idea for selection colors and we decided we're gonna give it a shot. Um, we very quickly just described a few uh, basic goals and potential issues. It's always nice to sort of approach project this way. So, you know, see all of the colors obviously in your selection, be able to do the thing that I just showed you, is switch between colors and styles because it's really important for me to give people on ramps to design systems because design systems can be intimidating, um, uh, but allowing you to sort of build up a design system as you go along can be interesting. The idea of swapping to colors kind of, kind of a thing, a potential issue is swapping to colors might be tricky. And how do we not make an overwhelming UI? If you make a big selection, you have a million of colors. So um, Jonah started building something and I started designing it a little bit more intentionally, right? You can see that the UI is now different because Figma changed its UI in the interim. And I tried to address some of these issues already. You know, you can see that it, some of the explorations look like document colors, which are more like smaller fields. On the right, you can see like I am, I was actually thinking of maybe showing, you know, if you select a big selection, what, not only what colors are the most popular, but how exactly popular are they? Um, uh, at the same time, you know, so we started building it together and I focused a little bit on coding the UI part and Jonas did the hard part of actually coding it internally. This is, this is the list of all the PRs during the maker week that we put together. Uh, some of our early um, things did not go very well. <laughs> this is, turns out our color picker is very, very interested in showing up on the screen. So like when we just plugged it to selection colors, it started doing something like this, which is really funny. Um, um, and very quickly we realized we actually have a lot more to do than we sign up for. So one very quick question for you that we had to face is what to do with gradients. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, this is the wrong one. What to do with colors that are the same and but different transparency, right? So if you have black that's 20%, 30, 50, 100%, do we show it uh, all as separate colors or do we show it as one color? What do you think is right? A or B, right? Like maybe uh, we can vote in chat or no, there's a poll, right? There's a q &A. Anyway, Joey and, and Azra can tell you how to do it. How are we voting? 
yeah, feel free to just drop in chat there. Lots of A's. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really interested. Uh, I see the chat too, so I see. Yeah, I see. Uh, I see a lot of A's. Couple B's. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can see the case for B as well. Says Sarah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I think it seems like A is most popular. I'm starting to warm up to B, okay. <laughs> yeah, so some people are going through the same set of emotions that we went through. Um, we were deciding and at some point, you know, there's always this interesting part of the process where you, you, you have to think about it, but then you have to decide, right? And then you launch it or build a beta version and then you, you just live with the consequences and you change your mind. So we decided we're gonna go for B. Uh, uh, so that seemed to make more sense and, and that particularly made more sense because if you have a tint, right, that it's 20%, 50%, 100%, that almost goes against the idea of selection colors if you show it three times, right? If we're supposed to simplify messing up with colors, um, the, uh, this is my call at this moment was that we do it this way. Okay, but I have another question for you. What to do with gradients? It's gonna be the same thing. So if you have a gradient with three color stops, do we show those colors individually or do we show just gradients all together? Uh, again, I'm really curious, what do you think uh, is the right thing? <laughs> oh, wow, okay. This is as close to design consensus as I've ever seen. Uh, no, Joey messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, it seems like a lot of people are going with a B, uh, which we chose A. <laughs> so I had this idea that like, no, why would we do B? If you have a grade and it starts with blue and you have that blue separately, you want to change them at the same time, right? You want this to show up at the color. So we decided to do um, gradients this way. And there were other problems like this. I'm not gonna like do a quiz for all of them because we would be here all day. But basically we realized we actually um, pushing on, the selection colors are actually pushing on the very fabric of Figma, which was a really interesting challenge. Figma wants to do two things and it, they, it does so really well. One is direct manipulation, right? Like whatever, whenever you update something, it needs to be updated like immediately. Right? You handle it, you drag it, there's no forms to fill out, there's no like programming language, you just manipulate things. So whenever you change the color, it should just change, right? There shouldn't be an okay button, whatever. The second thing, multiplayer, not only those things update um, for you, they immediately update for everybody else in the file. That's how Figma was built and that's the beauty of Figma, but it creates challenges. Here's an example, you have two colors and you just wanna swap them. That's the swapping colors issue that I mentioned before. What would happen if you change the color to this and then you want to change the other to the reverse, right? I, I'm actually going to show it to you because this is fun. So how do we do this? Let's say I pick this, this thing and we have, uh, we, have, we have two shades of gray, right? We have this darker gray and a lighter gray. So let's say I want to swap them, right? So we have A5 here and B6 here. I type B6 here because that's natural. But now they both became B6, right? Selection calls just like immediately jumped in, swapped them. And I, the other one ceased to exist as an independent color, right? So what we decided we wanted to do, and actually took some effort, if you have a color picker open, you can swap it. And you see that there's now two colors with the same color. And I can go back here and you can swap it this way. But if you do it right here in this panel, it doesn't. Right? It's, it immediately does uh, change it and kind of group it together, which you could sort of argue maybe is weird, but the challenge here is that some people might wanna do both, right? Sometimes you wanna clear the colors and you want them to collapse. And sometimes you wanna swap them and you want the list to stay in place. And uh, those are both valid use cases. And we thought that the presence of a color picker might be a good indicator of like, I'm not done yet, or I'm still messing with it. Um, another thing, if you just swap the hue of the color like, should we resort it immediately, right? Like based on the, on the color, it feels kind of funny, right? If you just look at this animation, 
it's really kind of disturbing to see the color go up and down. So we had to freeze some of this. And again, going against the nature of Figma. Another one, imagine that you drag a color and just meet another color in between. Like if we just leave it to its own devices, all of these colors are gonna be like collated on the way. I'm gonna grab all of the colors and at some point they all become one color, right? That's like the logical way to approach this. And at some point the selection colors disappears because it doesn't have any work to do, but I just lost all of the colors. So um, we sort of had to, uh, you know, deal with all these sort of like weird use cases um, that really had to push on, on the fabric of Figma. Um, we did a, a lot of internal testing. This is one of the many bug bash files, which is like a bunch of us jump in the file and try to prove selection colors wrong. And, and we did a design crit internally. And this is um, where I found that all of you were right and I was wrong. <laughs> Everybody wanted B. It was just me who was just like, A makes perfect logical sense, right? We just do B. So, uh, so we swapped that um, and uh, it worked. Uh, and there were so many more details that we had to account for, right? What to do with transparent colors, uh, what to do with invisible colors, like things that are like invisible hidden layers, masks, Boolean ops, effects, what to do with really large selections, all sorts of things like that. Did you know that two colors can have the same hex value, but they're not the same color? Because the hex values only give you this much resolution, but we actually have more resolution than 16 million. It's wild. There was just so many things. I, I just ran out of screen. Um, and there are also some things, as always, it was important to acknowledge that we did two things. One, we just decided to not do something that we wanted to do. We launched V1 without changing colors to styles and vice versa. We did it, I mentioned V2. We had a little targeting icon to show you the frames. I'm not happy with that icon, but it seemed okay. And we didn't really, we, we explored so many different ideas. And we had this idea to like allow you to quick swap between two colors much more easily. You know, all of the things that I showed you, they're still a little cumbersome, but we couldn't think of a UI that wouldn't make it even more complicated. And the one other thing that I wanted to acknowledge that was kind of hard um, to figure out was this idea. In Figma, if you have a style and if you choose it, the pop-up appears here, right, right underneath. It's so easy and clear and close to the cursor. But in selection colors, let me select all of them. Um, we made it fly out on the side. And that is to be consistent, first of all, with selection colors. Sorry, with colors, with a color picker. And second of all, it still allows you to see all of the selection colors. So you have feedback on both sides, but it's really inconsistent, right? We chose to have to prefer internal, sorry, local consistency over global inconsistency. We could have done the other way, I suppose. Um, and in general, I'm not very happy with it because it is a weird inconsistency either way. But I think like as with many of those projects, it's basically, we will try to fix it whenever we do a bigger overhaul of the whole UI, right? That seemed like the right place to just solve it systemically because we just made Figma do something we haven't thought of before and we just walked ourselves into this interesting corner. And so for me, it was really interesting, like personally, to go from this like one idea that I had before even joining Figma to actually like seeing it work and seeing other people use it, which is even more fun, right? Uh, uh, to launch it and see other people just sort of like, what do they do with it and um, how they use it creatively. It was also really fun, this collaboration between design and engineering where um, you notice that very little design has been done up front, right? I made a few mocks, but immediately we jump in talking to Jonas about the consequences of some of those ideas and how engineering should uh, build this up. And I think that's like how we do a lot of Figma projects, basically engineering needs to be there immediately because all of these things are really hard to engineer. Um, but I think like the, another, another thing that I realized actually during building of the project partly was um, how like selection colors, they, it just feels like the nice Figma, like the Figma way of doing things in a way that it's, you know, it couldn't be used for many things, right? Could it be used to clean up your course or lint them? Could it be used for like quick explorations? upgrading to a style and vice versa, like break a design system if you want to upgrade it. Um, you know, you can find like find and repress colors. You can also use it for that. Um, and you can use, like you can imagine like separate functions for all these things, right? You can imagine like separate UIs and menu items for all of these functions. And selection calls felt like the right kind of like 
it's powerful, but hopefully still simple. And you can combine to do all sorts of different things and probably a few things that we never thought about, right? And uh, that was like a really nice way to think about it. And I think a lot of Figma feels like, like a very powerful building blocks that you can master and use in, in, in powerful combinations. Um, so that's selection colors. And you know, I, I'm not really paying too much attention to chat, but we'll see. I'm curious if you have any more questions uh, and uh, do the little Q&A afterwards. And I'm curious how you use selection colors and what's missing still, or if some of my design decisions were wrong, right? We already learned that some of them were wrong. So there's probably more of them there. Uh, but I wanted to jump to the other thing we have for today, which is uh, type details. Um, that's something very, very important for me, uh, typography. And uh, this is um, an aspect of typography that I think has been sort of short change for many, many years. So all of the fonts, excuse me. Pretty much most modern fonts um, have the secret properties called open type properties, right? Open type styles, um, open type features. Um, they look something like this. Each one has an on and off switch and you can just use it to sort of dig into some of the font sort of secrets, right? So I have this font here. If I type fractions, this becomes a fraction, right? It's as simple as that. Uh, um, if I want to, uh, find some fonts have different versions of different letter forms just for special uses. If I toggle stylistic alternates, I can see them. It's pretty cool. Ligatures, you know, ligature is a combination of two letters. Some of them have discretionary ligatures. Discretionary means like use at your own discretion. So that's simple. It's a nice UI, right? It, it, it makes perfect sense. Um, except only on the surface, right? Because there's so many problems with it. First of all, um, the first open type UIs that were made in the 1990s where this thing became real looked a little bit even worse than that. They were menus, right? The sort of the same idea, you have options with check marks, you can toggle them on and off. But the menu is like this kind of menu where you fly out multiple times and you click it and it closes and you have to fly out again. It's like, it's really cumbersome and it sort of really gets you out of the flow. And these are like the original 1990s menus but this doesn't look like 99, right? This is a modern UI. Some of them still look like this. Um, and that bothered me because this really takes the joy away from exploring a font. Um, and a lot of what we think about at Figma is like how to get you somewhere really fast and with a lot of fun, right, at the same time. Like selection course hopefully allows you to do that. But there's also another big problem. Even if you have the checkboxes, which is arguably a slightly better UI, like this is another font and it has the six open type properties. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, I have no idea what any of this is. Okay, tabular numerals, I think it's something to do with numbers, tables, doesn't do anything. Proportional, okay, I know what proportional means. Oh, okay, this gets proportional. Okay, that makes sense. I can make the numbers proportional. I guess they were not proportional. And Oh, and this toggles it back to where it was. That's kind of weird. Okay, lining. I don't know what lining means. Okay, it also doesn't do anything. Old style. Oh, okay, it looks kind of old timey. And lining, I may imagine, yeah, it reverts it. Can I combine them? Yeah, I guess I can, but only some combination stylistic set. I wonder what that is. Oh, the G changes. Okay, that's kind of cool. All right, I wonder what changes what, oh. Okay, that's weird. So yeah, I'm role playing here because I know what they do. But um, this is what a lot of fonts make you feel. There's a lot of words that are hard to understand. There's a lot of combination that makes sense and a lot of things that just don't do anything. That's literally what happens with a lot of open type features. And I wanted to solve it because this is really no fun. If you know this font and you know these words and you've used them before or you look at the spec of this particular font, sure, you will know exactly what to do. But most people don't do that. A lot of people using Figma are not professional typesetters who've been on the job for 15 years and maybe actually studied typography and typesetting. A lot of people just, they're new to design. But why should we take the fun, the fun of fonts away from them? So very early on, this was another Maker Week project. I didn't realize it until preparing for this talk. 
where I wanted to make a better UI. And this was my proposal. Um, so, you know, we have Figma here. Um, and by the way, uh, somebody will put all of these prototypes, we will share links to them. Um, so you can actually play with them either right now, maybe not, it might be distracting, but we will share them and you can explore them later to your heart's content and send me any questions you have about how they're built. Um, I thought it'd be fun to share. So you can see here that first of all, the, the features are grouped, you know, so there's like ligatures, feature set, case set, and number set. Um, it also shows you exactly what's going to change before you click it, right? So you can see that the TH and CO are going to change. It gives you this preview immediately before you do anything. And, you know, if I delete some things, it like immediately adjusts to tell me how the feature relates to what I type. You know, so if I type like San Francisco, you can see that this shows different ligatures and you can toggle them. Um, so that felt more promising to me, right? You get immediate feedback, what's gonna, what's happening. You know in advance what's gonna happen. You even in gray shows you this stuff is not gonna change anything because you don't have any of those characters, right? If I add parentheses, it becomes, oops, um, don't call it San Fran. If you, um, if you now click this, right? And those still gray, gray because you have no numbers. Right. So I thought that was a nice feature and I felt like pretty happy about it. So at some point later, I did another prototype, which basically just tried to put it in the context of Figma, right? So now you see the UI of Figma and, um, you know, and it has the regular flyout menu and it has some of the same properties. It's a little bit evolved, but you very quickly start realizing this is really messy, right? Like you, you can barely see the difference here. Uh, there's a lot of shades of gray, a lot of shades of blue, like, the whole thing was to try to make it simple and nice to use, but it's sort of like oversh overshot in a different way. So I didn't even have to test it with anybody to know this is not gonna go. So the next prototype was a very different idea. What if we had a preview that just shows you what's gonna happen for this one feature, right? So you don't have these little previews, you can use a bigger font size. And for example, if I change the case, you can see it on the left, you know, because I have my text, but you can also see it here. And this is useful, for example, if you don't have some features, like if you don't have numbers, I don't have numbers on the left, but I can still see how they would change if I had them, right? So there's like a little bit of a different approach and, and the same with positions, you know. So, so I thought, you know, you can see all of these ligatures that, that I could use if I wanted to. Um, so this actually gives you a little bit more of a feedback what's promising, but still something weird about it. Like the preview is only there when I click. I don't know, didn't feel great. So I explored another idea that uh, this, at this point I showed it to the design team and different people were like, here's some other ideas. And I explored some of them. One of them was this one. What if each one has a little preview sort of underneath, which you know was kind of fun to build, but it's just like, look at this arrow. It's like the smallest arrow I've ever seen in my life. Back to being messy. I don't know. You can also see that like Figma itself evolved. So now we switch from the old UI to the new UI in the interim because those things take time. And playing with this and other ideas made me realize I actually like the preview. Like there's still something there that I felt was promising. So I went back to this idea. I cleaned it up a little bit. I made it now appear on hover. Um, and, and I started feeling kind of better about this. So at this point, we arranged for user testing. And what happened was this sort of magical thing that happens once in a while that I really love, where in the middle of user testing, just by watching people use it, I had this breakthrough. I, I, I realized like I've done one thing wrong and if I fix it, everything's gonna fall into place. And I literally changed it in the middle of user testing. So half of the people saw the old one and some of the people saw the new one. There was the same thing that happened later with auto layout as well, which is really funny. But here's the change. Here you see those toggles and the preview only happens after you click. It's weird, right? Like you don't wanna, like this, the, the preview, it's not a post view, it's a preview, right? So, so that's broken. And I made this change so that you could, have this toggle look a little bit different and you can see what's gonna happen before you even click, which seems super obvious in hindsight. But it took me a while to get there. 
And now, even if this doesn't affect my text at all, I can just see what, what would happen if I had those letters, right? And I could like add them and change them. And this made it just work. People got it immediately. And this is pretty close to what we shipped, which I have right here with one of my favorite sort of old school fonts, Warnock Pro. And I wanna tell you a little bit more about some of the details that we did here. Um, one of them, again, grouping, right? We grouped, this now looks a little bit different. And this production actually has bits and pieces of all of the prototypes we've seen so far, which is like a fun thing to realize. Like every, all, a lot of these prototypes sort of died in a cause of a bigger UI. So you have um, letter case first, you know, some of the things we had to have before, alignment of course, but like you have letter case, you have numbers, you have letter forms. And as we go down, it just becomes, you know, more esoteric and less useful features. We now have all of the features, but they're grouped by use. Um, some of them were grouped together. Like remember the like tabular numerals and those other things that were there and you could toggle like all of like 16 different options independently basically, even though a lot of them didn't make sense. We just like bunch them together into this just one simple toggle. It has four of the options. You have a little preview, you have a bigger preview, you don't have to know anything about those words. You can still hover over and understand what they are. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but they're grouped together. The same with uh, subscript and superscript and a bunch of other things. Uh, case is the same. Some of these are not even open type features. They're just like making things like all caps, but you group them because you just want to use one case out of six or five options, right? You don't have to um, do that. Uh, thing where like some of them are open type, some of them are CSS, et cetera, et cetera. And another thing that like, it's not obvious at all, but um, the words mattered here a lot. There was this whole idea that typography is filled with this esoteric obscure words, like even kerning or leading or widows or, you know, and you can celebrate them. It's fun to learn them. It's fun to be there and master typography, but they can also gatekeep, right? They can also be like, Kind of like, yeah, yeah, you know what? Learn typography before you. You have to be this tall to write typography, right? It's, that's no fun. And we wanted, we spent a lot of time just thinking about like, how do we name those things that in a way that's respectful towards the past, but it just also looks towards the future, towards like all of the people who will experience typography for the first time through Figma. So here we call it small caps. We just throw it like four small caps. We just force them for you. Hopefully that makes sense. We don't call them figures. We call them numbers, <laughs> even though it might be technically inaccurate, right? Like technically it's not a font, it's a typeface, right? Like it's all of this debate. Let's just cut through all of this. Let's not worry too much about it, right? Some of this try to find the right balance between like this is proportional and monospaced. They were never called monospaced before. They were called tabular, I think. I don't even know myself. We call them monospace because it's like a mon more common word. And we still use some of these like traditional words there as well for people who are used to them. Discretionary ligatures, eh, let's call them rare ligatures. Like rare is a word everybody understands. Kerning, let's call it kerning pairs, right? So it just hopefully makes it a little bit more approachable. The preview itself does a lot of work. You know, in many of those cases, it shows you exactly what's changing, you know? So all of these letters change when you use contextual swash. But in some of them, we choose the uh, preview for you. For example, with fractions, we just, this is a string that I just came up with um, because this tells you Warnock has a bunch of fractions, but not all of them, right? This gives you an extra bit of information. Um, for some of them, we just use the traditional thing with a little twist to give you a number because in the UI numbers matter a lot. Um, there's even an Easter egg. I, I think this is um, caffeine chemically. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. And this is something scarier or weirder. Um, still Easter egg here. And then one thing that's also important here is for example, this tells you the font doesn't support subscript, right? So we even use tooltips to help educate or like understand what are the relationships between what's available and what's not. There's some apps that synthesize subscript or superscript or bold, you know, they just like bold it by hand, uh, sorry, bold it sort of automatically. We don't do that. We can talk about where it's a right call or not. We only support subscript and super, uh, subscript and superscript if the font supports it. Now we're confessing to it because a lot of people were kind of confused um, about like, is it Figma? Is it the font? Who, who's to blame? if you will. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention, um, this is not even called 
open type, right? We wanted to call it type details because it's just a little bit friendly. Like who cares it's open type? Like you don't have to know what format it is to use it. Um, and it also frees us to do more things in the future. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of the feature. Um, and, and again, same stuff. Uh, some previews don't work for obscure fonts and we try to fix them for some, but at some point we just had to ship it. Fonts are really complicated. So in general, it's impossible to accommodate all of them. Variable fonts, I really wanted them and you can see them in some prototypes. We just had to wait until shipping in the future. Even character alternates, this first prototype that I had has even more features that I showed you. You can look at all of the things that are changing. And if you select something, you can see the alternate, you can swap it, and they're all cool features, right? Of course we want them, but they would take forever and we have to do other things. And we also incurred some UI depth. The checkboxes they came up with are kind of weird, like we've never used them before. And again, in, UI, in, in the next future UI, we might change them so they're all kind of come together nicely. Right now, it's a little bit weird. Um, and a lot of details like with, with uh, selection corals that we had to do, um, there's a rogue version of OpenType called AAT that I didn't even know about before we started building this. The details of the hover interaction. Some fonts are so broken that they can hang your browser or your computer because they go into infinite loops. Like fonts are actually programming languages inside. It's wild. We had to solve all of this. And uh, we also like self-imposed limitations. Remember when I was mentioning like we don't want to make it too complicated. You cannot hide the preview. It was there in the earlier mock uh, prototypes. We didn't have it. You cannot customize the preview because you have a text, so you can customize that. You cannot scroll the preview. A bunch of things that we just um, wanted to fix. And the last question would be why, right? Like, why does it matter to me? And, and I think for me, it's, it's some of the things I already talked about. We know this feature won't be used by a lot of people, actually. Those are nuances of type. Um, but maybe it will be used by more than before maybe some people will discover all of this feature because of this UI. Like a lot of this font details are so delightful and wonderful. It's really fun to, to explore, to see what the type designer wanted, to use them creatively. In my blog post, uh, you can find all sorts of like animations that I came up with just to celebrate like how amazing some of those open type features are and how fun it is to use them. How you almost feel like you're discovering something secret and this thing that like the font designer almost hid from you, right? And at the same time, like, I hope that this feature is not um, dumbing it down, right? If you're a pro in open time, if you've been using it since 1995, you still can get to all of those things. You cannot even look at the preview. You can click very things very quickly and it still works. So hopefully we find the right balance. And, and, and we even, oops, we even had this, um, this, I be, we built this playground, which is one of the first playgrounds with it, which, which I, I hopefully they will share a link to uh, Azra or Ojoi. Um, you can just explore. The fun thing about Figma is that you have all of these Google fonts and a lot of them have open type features. So we curated a list of like fun fonts that you can immediately start playing with and see how those features uh, matter to you. And so the last thing I wanted to mention is, it's sort of a more personal thing. So, um, as I mentioned, it's really fun to like build those things and mock them up and then collaborate with engineers and other designers to see them through fruition. It's really, really fun to see um, other people use this, right? To see people discovering open type details, to see people using selection course, to see people liking it or even not liking it. If they find weird bugs or problems or they call me out on my bad decisions, that's also amazing because it just makes it better. But for me, and I don't know how much it matters for all of you, although I have an agenda here, it's also really cool because I get to use this myself for my stuff that has nothing to do with Figma, which surprised me. I'm working on a book right now, and I use, I do some diagrams for the book. This is a book about keyboards and typing. Um, I use selection colors to change this into this. It took me five seconds. It was so much fun. I've always wanted it. And the same way, this is the at least current cover from my book. And you know, this is a font I'm working on for that book. This is a font from an old, um, an old uh, keyboard. And if I, I just realized this is, um, I already outlined the strokes. So let's just do this. Uh, this font. 
here we go. So this is my font that I'm creating for the book. And if only I knew how to type, it would be even better. I heard it's useful skill when you're writing a book. And um, I have all my type features in this font and I get to use it myself, <laughs> which doesn't matter for any of you, but, uh, you know, here's my book. Here's the same thing in print and here's the diagram. This, is, this book is still a work in progress, but I can see this right now, it's really fun. And that's just like one thing that I wanna highlight. If you ever consider working on a creative platform for other people, whether it's Figma or some other thing, I mean, please work at Figma. It would be fun to have you. I don't know, we're hiring, but anything else, it's also super fun to create canvases for other people to feel. And if you happen to be one of those people, it's also fun. So uh, thank you so much. This is all that I had for you today.